All right, uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about something that I didn't really think was uh, possible at first, um, but it's uh, it's going to be interesting. So the uh, the idea of backdoors is kind of thrown around a lot today to the point that it's it's largely lost all meaning. But uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is is not the management engine, it's not the platform security processor, it's none of the things that people are normally so concerned about. Um, it's, it's something that we never really saw coming and I think something a lot more interesting. But uh, before I begin, like any good research, I need to start off with a disclaimer. Um, I did all of this research on my own in my own time while I was an ind independent consultant and none of this reflects in any way the beliefs or actions of my uh, current employer. But with that, my name is Christopher Domus. I'm a cybersecurity researcher. I've tinkered with a lot of different things over the years, but uh, for the last couple of years, what I've been interested in is low-level processor exploitation and vulnerability research. So let's start off with a, a demo of kind of what I mean by that and the kinds of things we can unlock. And specifically, let's look at what we're going to explore today in, a, in this uh, in this presentation. So I am uh, logged into a system, um, just a regular system, unmodified, running default OS configuration. I'm logged in as an unprivileged user named Delta. I'm going to open up a .c file called demo.c. And demo.c is a very simple file. All we do is we load an address into the EAX register, then we've got a label, and then we've got all of these bound instructions. So the x86 bound instruction is not a very common instruction. You might not be familiar with bound, but the idea behind the x86 bound instruction is it will take an address and it will take a second address and see if the first address is within the bound specified by the second address. Now you'll notice this bound instruction has a rather unusual set of second addresses associated with it. These are basically look like random numbers and in fact this processor does not have access to the memory at that address that's being specified. And like anything else in x86, if you don't have access to the memory that you're trying to use, you will get a general protection exception or in Linux a segmentation fault. So despite the fact that, uh, sorry about that, despite the fact that all of these um, registers we know are going to cause segmentation faults uh, at the uh, at the end, uh, we're still going to try to launch a shell and see if anything happens. So uh, let's let's give this a try. We'll compile this uh, little program. Um, we will execute it, and sure enough, just like we expected, we get a segmentation fault, and our user hasn't changed. So that's nothing um, terribly interesting here. But if I go back into this program, and I'm going to make one tiny little change, I'm going to add one x86 instruction. It's an instruction that's so secure or so obscure and unknown, it doesn't actually have a name. In fact, it doesn't. It's not supposed to exist. Um, I have to write this in machine code. OF3F is the one instruction I'm going to add to the beginning of my uh, executable. And when I execute this instruction, the fundamental nature of all the subsequent bound instructions is going to change. And what I'm going to be able to do is use those instructions to reach directly into the kernel, bypassing all of the processor's security mechanisms in order to give myself root access on this system. So this... So this kind of thing is, is not supposed to uh, exist. <laughs> um, and the rest of this presentation is going to be a long convoluted journey, sort of seeing how I came across um, this, this feature. And the whole thing begins with the idea of rings of privilege. So in the beginning, 30 years ago in x86, there was no concept of separation of privileges on the processor. Basically, any code running on the processor had the same permissions as any other code running on the processor, and things were basically chaos. There was nothing stopping Minesweeper from having the exact same privileges as the kernel, um, and that's not a good situation to begin. And so 30 years ago, um, they implemented the idea of separation of privileges, different rings of execution on x86 processors, and the idea was something like this. Um, only some code would have complete unfettered access to the entire system, um, unrestricted access to the system's hardware, and that was the kernel code that would live inside of the most privileged ring, ring zero. Then outside of ring zero, slightly less privileged code would live in ring one, less privileged than that in ring two, and our least privileged code where we would throw all of our user code would live in ring three. And that fundamental idea of separation is why um, we can have some sort of confidence that our Minesweeper game is not also harvesting credentials from my banking account sitting in another process, because in order for ring three code to do anything of importance, it has to go through very, very strict careful hardware security checks in order to ask Ring Zero to do something for it. So that's the fundamental basis of all security in x86 processors today. But we started digging deeper. Um, 
basically, uh, this, this ring model wasn't well suited for running multiple operating systems on one processor. We needed something more privileged than ring zero in order to handle that. So we invented the hypervisor. And since it was more privileged than ring zero, colloquially, we kind of called that ring minus one. But there's some things we didn't want the hypervisor to do. Uh, we threw all those things into system management mode. And since that was more privileged than the hypervisor, we called that ring minus two. And then a couple of years ago, some researchers came along and they said, hey, there's this entirely different uh, processor sitting on the platform that can actually do things that the x86 processor can't do. So we started calling that ring minus three. And it's just sort of getting ridiculous at this point. But if you've been following this research as it's sort of expanded over the last 20 years, in the back of your head, you've probably been thinking, like, can we go further? How deep does this rabbit hole go? And that's sort of the question and I, I set out to answer when I uh, went down this path. So when I'm uh, sort of beginning research on something really big and unknown, I found a good place to start is sometimes with patents, because sometimes you can find information in patents that you can't find in any other documentation. So given this idea of this privilege model, of these rings of, of privilege on x86, imagine my surprise when I was sifting through patents and I saw this uh, little blurb just sort of nonchalantly buried in the, in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of a patent on a completely different idea. It said, additionally, accessing some of the internal control registers can enable the user to bypass security mechanisms, for example, allowing ring zero access at ring three. My head kind of exploded when I saw this. Like, all of our security on x86 is based around this idea of rings of privilege. And this little blurb is telling me there may be some way to circumvent all of that in one fell swoop. But they go on to say, in addition, these control registers may reveal information that the processor designers wish to keep proprietary. Well, that's kind of understandable. If I had some circumvention for all the uh, privilege mechanisms on the processor, I'd probably want to keep that proprietary too. But then they go on to say, um, for these reasons, the various x86 processor manufacturers have not publicly documented any description of the address or function of some of the control MSR. So, so that makes sense, but that means we're probably dealing with something undocumented that, that we don't have a lot of access to. So I did what any rational person would do in this situation. I went out and bought 57 computers to start doing some research on to see if I could dig into this th idea a little bit uh, further. So I, I had some idea, based on the patent owner and the patent time frame, I had some idea for what processor I might be trying to look at here. Um, but, but patents are a funny thing where the intellectual property gets bought by different entities and uh, ideas sort of trickle through the industry in weird ways. So I sort of wanted to ca cast a, a wide net to, uh, to try to analyze um, this, this idea of a, a ring circumvention mechanism. Um, but eventually what I settled on was a uh, processor with, or a system with a VIA C3 uh, processor. So VIA is one of the three major x86 manufacturers and C3 is a, a model that they had a, a while back. So these uh, were specifically targeted at embedded systems. Um, they're marketed towards point of sales, uh, kiosks, ATMs, um, gaming. Since we're in Vegas, you might want to start poking around after this. Uh, digital, digital signage, healthcare, digital media, industrial automation, and of course you can still find them in PCs and, and laptops. So uh, this was the system I eventually pulled off my shelf for this uh, research and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. Um, this is a thin client with a C3 Nehemiah core inside of it. And I'll talk later on about um, um, how, uh, how this issue might affect other processors, but for now that's the system we're going to be focused on. Now, um, I was unable to find a developer manual for this processor. That would have been a really useful starting point, but you know, even the patent sort of hinted at the idea that a lot of this stuff's not going to be documented. Um, so that means we have to find some other path forward. So what you can do in the situation, um, what I did was sort of try to follow a, a trail of patent breadcrumbs, just try to read different patents that might be related to one another in order to try to piece together as much information about this, this back door. Uh, as, as I can. So this, uh, this quote isn't actually from one of the patents I ended up using. This was just another um, patent that I stumbled across uh, along the way. But in order to give you some idea of what kind of things you're dealing with when you're reading this patent literature, I want to, to quickly give you an example of some, some patent speak. So this says, figure three shows an embodiment of a cache memory. Referring to figure three in one embodiment, cache memory 320 is multi-way cache memory. In another embodiment, cache memory 320 comprises multiple physical sections. In one embodiment, cache memory 320 is logically divided into multiple sections. In one embodiment, cache memory 320 includes four cache ways, i.e. cache way 310, cache way 311, cache way 312, and cache way 314. In one embodiment, a processor sequesters one or more cache ways to store or, or to execute processor microcode. Like, this is the most convoluted legalese 